we had a little planet. So I, I'm sorry, I have to tell you right up front though that you won't be able to go home tonight and build your own planet. I apologize for that. Oh, no, <laughs> there are two reasons for that. One is that I only have about 45 minutes to talk to you, so I can't possibly tell you everything there is to know about how to build a planet. And the other reason is that we actually don't know everything there is to know about how to build a planet, which is of course what makes it an exciting field to study. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to introduce you to some of the current ideas about how we think planets get built in the universe, and what kinds of planets we see around other stars, and what clues those planets can give us to the process of planet formation. Okay, uh, but I thought I would start off actually with a story, and the story is about a strange Christmas present that I received in the mail a few years ago. And I actually brought it to show you, so like you tend to do with strange Christmas presents, I hid this Christmas present in my closet for uh, a number of months. But at some point, I decided on a whim to bring it out and hang it up in my dining room. And when I did that, I found that I was having lots of interesting conversations about planet formation. <laughs> so, this is my strange Christmas present. <laughs> you can see it bears some passing resemblance to the solar system, right? Uh, there's something big and orange in the middle, and there are a number of things kind of spinning around it. Um, but if you look at it long enough, you'll start to see that there are actually a lot of ways in which this looks nothing like our solar system, right? Uh, so you can play this game with yourself. Uh, can, can anybody point out ways in which this is not like our solar system? Scale. Scale, yeah. They're <laughs> so, not in one plane. They're not in one plane. Very good one. Yeah, what else? They're too close to each other. Yeah, if, if the planets were like this in the actual solar system, they would kick each other out of the solar system very, very rapidly. Anything else? They're not in the right order. They're not in the right order. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Look at this. We've got little rocky things mixed in with big gas giants. You guys are really sharp. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. I don't, I don't know what this planet is supposed to be. <laughs> the colors are very pronounced. Yeah. No moons. Right, right. So, <laughs> you guys are. What's that? Yeah, if we're that close to the sun, we're in trouble. That's another good one. <laughs> The sun is much too small compared to the other planets. Yeah, so you guys have pointed out nearly all the things that I wanted you to see here. And the point of this is that there are a lot of ways you might imagine a solar system would look like. This is one of the ways that someone imagined a solar, that a solar system might look. They imagined that our solar system looked this way. And it doesn't look this way. And there are reasons why it doesn't look this way. So if we can make observations about what our solar system actually looks like and what other systems look like and compare them, um, that's my dining room, that's it, hanging in the dining room. And compare them to all the ways that we imagine a solar system might actually look, then we can learn something about the process of planet formation. So I'm going to start off today, once I put this away. So I'm going to start off today by telling you about some of the observations that we make, that we can make, that you guys can make from your backyards even, um, all the way from your backyard out to observations made with the largest and most advanced telescopes that we have, and what those tell us about the process of planet formation. So first of all, here's an observation that you can make from your backyard in Berkeley tonight if you want. And it's actually going to tell us something about planet formation. Um, I don't know how many of you know how to recognize planets in our solar system. Um, it's, a, it's not that hard. Basically, you just have to know where the bright stars are. And if you see some bright stars that aren't where the bright stars are supposed to be, those are planets, <laughs> um, for the most part. So you probably recognize this one, this is the moon. Of course, it's not a planet, but it is a body in our solar system. This happens to be the planet Venus, and this is the planet Saturn. So if you go outside and look for planets, one of the ways you might imagine our solar system would look from your backyard is you might imagine that there are planets all over the sky at any given time. They kind of move around, right? But that's not the case. Just like you see here, if you go out and look at the planets in the sky, they all kind of bunch up in this one strip around the sky. That's called the ecliptic. Is the plane of our solar system. All right, so that's strange. You could imagine the planets are all over the sky, but they're not. They're in a, in a flat plane. Somebody already pointed that out with our fake solar system. So if you happen to have a small telescope, there's another observation you can make. Actually, wait, before we get to the small telescope, the other thing you can do is you can watch the planets from night to night. And if they move across the sky from night to night, from month to month, from year to year, depending on the planet, they move across the sky, and all of the planets in the outer solar system move from west to east across the sky if you watch them at the time. They all move in the same direction. All right, so we've got planets in a plane, and they're all kind of moving in the same direction. If you take your small telescope, and you make a movie of the planet Jupiter, you can watch the red spot come out here. You can see that Jupiter is rotating in some direction. You can watch the moons orbit around Jupiter. 
and sometimes you'll even see their shadows go across the face of the planet. It's really neat. That's called a shadow transit. And if you watch Jupiter rotating, if you watch its moons rotating, if you watch all the planets going around the sky, what you'll notice is that they all go in the same direction. If you were looking down on the solar system from way, way above the North Pole of the Earth, you would see that all of the planets in the solar system, you'd see something like this. They orbit around the sun counterclockwise. All right, so that didn't necessarily have to be the case either, right? If you were thinking naively, you might think, well, there's no reason that all the planets orbit the same direction. Maybe they all orbit randomly. Maybe they all buzz around like bees in a hive. But that's not the case. They orbit flat, and they all orbit in the same direction. And for the most part, they all spin around on their axis in the same direction, counterclockwise. All right, so there's a preferred spinning direction in the solar system, and the solar system is flat. So I'll leave you with those ideas, and we'll go out to another familiar in the night sky, which is Orion. Um, has anyone ever looked through a telescope at, our, at Orion? Yeah, lots of people. Wow. All right, we've got lots of astronomy books here. So if you look through a telescope at the constellation Orion, you probably looked into SOAR down here, and you probably saw something that looked a little bit like this. This is sort of what the Orion Nebula looks like if you look at it through a small telescope. You see some bright stars, you see some glowing gas and dust around those stars. And if somebody was showing you this through a telescope, they probably told you that this is a stellar nursery. This is the place where stars are being born. So if you look at this with a better telescope, like, say, the Hubble Space Telescope, you see something that looks a lot more like this. It's a better telescope. <laughs> um, yeah, so you see something that looks a lot more like this. You see those clouds, but you see the, the stars in the center here, but you also see these incredible, wreathing, glowing tendrils of gas and dust in the Orion Nebula. And that's actually important. These things wreath around, and they look kind of like smoke from a cigarette or a fire. They're actually very similar to cigarette smoke in the sense that the particles of dust in the Orion Nebula are about the same size as particles in cigarette smoke. They're very, very tiny, micron size. So this is a stellar nursery. This is a place where stars are being born, and that means it's also a place where planets are being born. And what happens is that the denser parts of this nebula, parts at random, they'll come together, and they'll come together enough that gravity can take over and pull them together. They collapse under the influence of gravity. And what happens in that case, you can see that these things are kind of slowly spinning around. But if you've ever watched the Olympics and you've seen figure skaters, this is the classic annual momentum analogy. You see a figure skater in the Olympics and she starts to spin, and then she pulls in her arms and she spins much faster, right? The same thing happens in space. These things that are reaping slowly on large scales, when they collapse under the influence of gravity, they start to spin really fast. And another thing that you've probably seen in your everyday life is somebody making a pizza, right? So what do you do when you make a pizza? You spin the dough, and that makes it flatten and spread out into a disc-like shape. So we imagine that when stars are forming in the Orion Nebula, the same kind of thing might happen. And you don't have to imagine it, you can actually see it. So here is the Orion Nebula again. If we zoom in with the Hubble Space Telescope, once again, we can see these little knots where stars and planets stars and planetary systems are forming. And if you zoom in on those knots, this is what you see. You see the young stars in the center here. You see the glowing background nebula. And silhouetted against that nebula, you see things that look awfully like a pizza. You see these flattened structures of gas and dust orbiting around the young stars. And that's because things that are reaping around on a large scale and bring them to a small scale, they want to flatten and spread out. So you get a disk of gas and dust. So think back now to the observations that we were talking about of our own solar system. We know that our solar system is flattened. We know everything is spinning in the same direction. We know that things are spinning on their axis, for the most part, in the same direction in the solar system. And we think that that's because they formed out of a flattened disk of gas and dust, like we see in these young star forming regions. And you don't have to take my word for it. This is another observation you can actually go out and make with your eyes. If you're ever in a dark place around sunset, has anyone ever seen the zodiacal light before? Yeah, a few people have. So you can actually go out at sunset, and you can look at the horizon after the sun has set, and you'll see this band of light coming up from the horizon, and it follows that same plane that you see the planets in in the sky. It's called zodiacal light. And it's basically dust left over from this stage in our solar system's formation, although it comes from asteroids grinding up in the asteroid belt and releasing some of that dust a second time. It's not the original dust. Yeah? What, what did you call that? Zodiacal light. Zodiacal light. Like the zodiac. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the zodiac, of course, follows the plane of our solar system, the, the zodiacal constellations. All right, so we take all of these observations and we put them together, and what do we have? Solar systems form out of a single cloud of gas and dust flattened into a disk. So that's the first thing you need to know about planet formation. All right, so if we think about that for a minute, that actually leads us to some other strange ideas. And the first strange idea that that leads us to is that the Earth formed out of the same stuff as the Sun. So you look at them today and you think they're totally different, right? The Sun is this huge blade.
flaming ball of gas. It's mostly hydrogen, and the Earth is a cold, rocky dirt ball with things crawling all over it. That's us. Uh, so if you look at objects in the solar system, they look quite different. And if you look at their compositions, they are quite different. So the sun is about three quarters hydrogen, one quarter helium. Only about 2% of the sun is made of elements heavier than helium. Earth, on the other hand, has almost no hydrogen and helium. It's 99% heavier elements. If you look at Jupiter, and it looks a little bit more like the sun, about 3 quarters hydrogen, 1 quarter helium, but it has 2 to 3 times as many heavy elements as the sun does. And the last thing I put up here is a person. I put this up not just to be goofy, although a little bit was to be goofy, but a person is made of about 10% hydrogen by weight. Most of that is in the water in our bodies, of course. Helium, almost no helium in our bodies, 90% other elements. So the reason I put a person up here is that where do most people form in the solar system? They form on the Earth, right? <laughs> yeah, so the point is, we're forming, out of, we're forming on the Earth, which means we're forming out of the same material on the Earth, and yet we wind up with very different compositions. So this is biology and this is physics, but the point is that depending on the process that forms a particular body, you can form out of the same material and wind up with very different compositions. So what I wanted to talk to you about next is what we actually think happens in this disk of gas and dust that gives us things with different composition, like Jupiter or the Earth. So what I'm going to describe to you now is just a quick outline of the most popular theory of how planets form around other stars. It's called the core accretion theory of planet formation. And it has three steps. And the first step, you've all done in your lives. This is when you get small dust grains to stick together to form larger dust grains. And the context in which you might have done this, so first of all, astronomical dust is not quite like the dust bunnies under your bed, it's kind of similar, but it's a little bit more like sand at the beach. We actually see when you take a spectrum of the dust grains in space, they look like they have a lot of olivine and pyroxene, and olivine is the thing that actually makes the green sand beaches on Hawaii green. So really they are like sand grains. So you guys have all participated in this first process of planet building already. You get small dust grains to stick together to form large dust grains, and you've done that any time you build a sand castle at the beach, right? It's actually a very similar process. Maybe the grains are a little wet, and that helps them to stick together. In space, they might have ices on them, and that can help them to stick together. Um, but in the Orion Nebula, those tiny, tiny micron-sized dust grains, when they meet each other in space, they glom onto each other, and they stick together. And people like Carson Dominic spend a lot of their time simulating dust grains sticking together in space. It's very active area of research. All right, so that's step one. Step two is a problem. And you know about this at the beach, too. It's very easy to get sand grains but if you start throwing rocks at each other, do you think they're going to stick to each other? No, of course not. So the problem is, and this is actually a serious problem in planet formation, is how do you get small rocks to stick together and make planetary embryos? And planet formation is called the meter size problem. It's very hard to get things that are about a meter in size to stick together. They're not naturally very sticky, and they don't have enough gravity to hold together by gravity. So what do you do? And um, so we don't really have the answer to this question yet, but probably the best idea so far has to do with turbulence. Now these disks are turbulent. This is actually something that I study in my research, is how turbulent are these disks. And so far, as far as you can tell, the turbulence in these disks is, in terms of velocity, about 10 times worse than the worst turbulence that an airplane has ever encountered on Earth. This is like the turbulence, you know, they say turbulence doesn't crash airplanes, but this is like the turbulence that would crash an airplane, and it's 10 times worse, all right? So you don't want to fly your airplane through a certain um, but the idea is that if you've ever, you know, paddled a canoe or a kayak down a turbulent stream, vortices and eddies can form in that turbulence, right? And when you're paddling your canoe down a stream, what collects in those vortices? Things like leaves and twigs, they collect in the vortices. And so we think that the same thing might happen in a protoplanetary disk. The disks are turbulent, so they make vortices, and those vortices help to collect these little, uh, you know, these little pebbles that you can make by sticking small dust grains. And if you can collect enough pebbles in that vortex, then gravity will start to hold it together. And you can skip over that meter-sized problem of once gravity's holding things together, you're all finished. Because after that, once you can get gravity to hold a bunch of rocks together, you've made the core of a planet. And you can go on to step three. Once you've made the core of a planet, something about 10 times the mass of the Earth, very big, it happens probably pretty quickly once you have the meter size. Um, you get these large embryos, planetary embryos. So these are rocky cores, like I said, about 10 times the mass of the Earth, and they sweep up material to form a gas giant planet. So here's a picture of what we think that might look like. This is a simulation of a disk with a planet forming in it. And this planet has gotten to the point where it's big enough to sweep up gas, so it has eaten 
out a ring around the star here. Okay, you believe that? And the cool thing is that we can actually now start to see these kinds of systems. And this is another thing that I work on in my research. So these are some observations from radio telescopes where you're seeing a dusty disk with a big hole in the middle. These um, little plus signs mark the place where the star is located. So we think that once a planet gets big enough about the mass of Jupiter, it will clear out this whole area in the center of the disk, and we can actually image that with large radio telescopes. Um, so that's very exciting, and it's only become possible in the last four years or so. Yeah, are there some questions then? Yeah. I mean, what is the fluid that's being so terribly turbulent? The fluid is actually the gas. The gas is very turbulent. So these are the very, very tiny particles. Very tiny particles, yeah. And I mean, if you want to get into the details of this, one of the questions is, so you need viscosity to make turbulence. Where does that viscosity come yeah. from? And that is a whole other question, actually a very active area of research. But we think that it has to do with magnetic fields, actually, not the gas particles rubbing into each other, not the molecular viscosity, but rather the magnetic fields in the disk are responsible for the turbulence. And where does the magnetism come from? Oh, that's a whole other question. <laughs> um, astronomers kind of have a joke. If you don't understand something, you say it's because of magnetic fields. Right? <laughs> magnetic fields are very difficult to explain. Yeah. Do the gas giants in our solar system have pores? Um, that's a really interesting question. So Jupiter almost certainly does. We're not actually sure if Saturn does or not. Um, and that's an active area of research also. Uh, the observations are consistent with it having a core, but it doesn't require it. So I'll come back to that idea later on, actually, that there are alternative ideas for how some of the outer gas giants can form. Yeah? Well, um, on the left illustration, it's very clear that there is a, yeah. a, a, a ample space which is bounded both on the inside and the outside. Yep. And the other two, the uh, two smaller ones in the middle, yep. um, it's it, the ample space the in the empty. middle. So how do you distinguish what you're talking about from what's caused by stellar winds? Oh, that's a really good question. You guys are very audience. So, um, <laughs> uh, basically, distinguishing it from stellar winds is difficult, but, uh, okay, so there are a few things I can say. The first thing that I'll say is these observations are actually, believe it or not, unable to distinguish between a completely empty hole and a hole where there's a little bit of optically thick material near the star. And in some of these systems where we can image a large inner hole, we actually see evidence from the spectrum that there is a dust disk remaining around the star, a small dust disk. So we actually do see lots of evidence for these gaps and it's very hard to do that with a stellar wind. So that's the short answer. I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> uh, but we can talk about it afterwards if you like. Um, any other questions? Oh, yep. Uh, magnetism, that implies that there's some metallic material, right? Um, no, not necessarily, actually. Um, it implies that there's charged material, um, and you can have molecules that are charged. So, um, but we think that actually, we, we observe magnetic fields spreading star forming regions. And so you can imagine that once collapse happens, that pulls the magnetic field together and makes its energy a little bit higher once you increase the density of the magnetic field. Yeah. Will you, during this lecture, address where the any theory of where the initial angular momentum come from? Um, no. <laughs> but we can talk about that afterwards if you're interested. Yeah. Any more questions before I move on? Yes. You mentioned that it suits up the gases and that, but if you're forming a planet and you have iron and heavy elements, aren't those there also? Yeah, so th this is the, the point of the core, the core accretion theory. It's kind of a, a strange idea, but we think that the dust, the metallics, the metallic elements, we call, you can call the metallic things dust, and then everything that's left is gas. Um, so, uh, all right, so we think that those metallic elements come together first and make the core. But you're right, there's probably still some dust mixed in with the gas later on. But we think that the dust, the metallic elements, separate out of the disk first. And that only once you have enough dust to have a lot of gravity can you start to hold gas onto Because gas is very light. It's very hard to hold it onto a body. So you need a very massive core before you can do that. And that has to be made out of that metallic, dusty material. And where did the dust come from? Um, well, we see it in star-forming regions. Uh, we can talk about the history of matter in the universe if you want. But it's a little bit outside the, um, the what I was hoping to talk about today. All right, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so this is the idea. This, this is core accretion theory. Um, so, okay, let's go back to the solar system now. And we talked about, that's, that's how we think giant planets form. And we think that rocky planets form in a similar way, but why don't they have a big gaseous envelope? All right, so if we go back to the solar system and kind of take a tour of the solar system, 
Um, you imagine that you're an alien coming in, you've never seen the solar system before, you go visit the star, it's just a, a standard big burning gas ball, and you start to take a tour of the solar system. You say, okay, Mercury, that's, that's a little hot. Venus, oh, the surface is hot enough to melt sulfuric acid. It does kind of have an atmosphere, but it rains, I, I mean, the surface is hot enough to melt lead, and it rains sulfuric acid, not a very nice place to visit. Earth, yeah, that's not so bad. I could stay there. Um, Mars, you know, maybe with a little works and terraforming, it could be a nice place to live series. So if you're an alien at this point, you think the solar system is full of these small rocky bodies. It's not until you get out of Jupiter that you say, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> right? Something happened in between Ceres and Jupiter. Um, and then as you go farther out in the solar system, all of a sudden you have gas giants, and they do get a little bit smaller, and that's because you can imagine you're kind of running out of material on the disk. And by the time you get out to the Kuiper belt, you just have these little rocky ice balls again. So basically there are three kinds of planets in our solar system, and we think that what's going on here is that there's some line. And in the early solar system, there's this imaginary line. And inside that imaginary line, ice and methane and all of these other volatiles were in gas form. And outside that line, they were in ice form. So when they're in ice form, that means they're a lot more solid in the solar system. So it's easier to build up a big solid core. And once you can build up a big solid core, you can start to retreat these gaseous atmospheres. Inside that line, the ice is in the form of a gas. So they're about four times less solid. So it's harder to build up those big cores. And they're closer to the sun, so it's hard to hold on to a big gas atmosphere. Yeah. When that's the disk, is it because the heavier stuff uh, got pulled closer to the sun, or and the lighter stuff was hard to hold on to, so it was out far? That's a good question. Actually, in the beginning, no. We see gas and dust really well mixed throughout most of the disk. That's a good question, though. Um, okay. So there's this ice line in the early solar system. Inside that, we have these rocky planets. Outside, we have the gas giants. And when you run out of material on the disk, you get left with the rubble in the so this is the picture of our solar system. And the story that I've told you, it's a very nice story. Our planet formed in a disk. The properties of the planet depend on where it formed in the disk. And we think we understand something about how gas giant planets are made. It's formation theory. So the question is now, is our solar system normal? Um, because until about 15 years ago, we imagined that there were probably planets around other stars, but nobody had ever seen one. So we sort of thought that our solar system was probably like other solar systems. Um, and you all probably know the answer to this, which is that uh, we found a lot of strange planets. Um, so the second half of my talk is going to be about how we observe planets around other stars and what we see when we go out and look for planets around other stars and what that tells us about whether or not our solar system is normal. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is how we look at other solar systems. How do we learn about planets around other stars? Um, so actually, can I get a couple of volunteers, especially if there's a planet chi a parent child Pair in the audience? Can I get a parent and a child in this group? Or actually, I can get the, a big brother and a little brother. You guys want to come help? Yeah. All right. So come on up here. Now, the first thing I want to tell you about is what happens when this is a, a way of looking for planets. You guys can come on right over here. This is a way of looking for planets um, where we just look at the star and it tells us about the presence of a planet orbiting it. Okay. So you're going to be our star and you're going to be our planet. What are your name? Dragon. Dragon? Serpent. Serpent. All right, great. <laughs> okay, so dragon, can you spin around in a circle? So dragon is now a star. He's just spinning around in space. That's what it looks like when a star spins around by itself in space. Okay, now dragon and serpent, can you guys hold hands and spin each other around? Okay, so I want you guys to imagine now that serpent is invisible. Can you still tell that dragon has a planet even though serpent is invisible? It's different, right, when he's just spinning around in place and when he's spinning around with his brother there, he has to lean back a little and he comes towards you and away from you. Does everyone see that? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you both. You did a great job. <laughs> okay, so there are two ways of looking for planets by studying the parent star or the big brother star. All right, so if you have a star and a planet orbiting each other, obviously when we saw dragon and serpent spinning around, serpent did a lot more of the spinning, right? Because he's littler and lighter. And the same thing happens to the planet, but it's very hard to see planets, which is why we look at the star instead. So there are two ways of inferring the presence of a planet by looking at the star. One is radial velocity, and that's exactly what we saw when Dragon was leaning back, spinning towards us and away from us as he pulled his brother around. So the, the idea behind this is, this is one of Newton's laws, right? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. The star pulls on the planet, but the planet also pulls on the star. So if we look for radial velocity, that motion towards and away from us, that's called the wobble method. 
or, uh, or a Doppler pattern. Astrometry is if you were looking down on them from above and you could see the star moving around in these little circles in response to the planet. That's called astrometry. That's just looking for those little circles in the sky and looking for that position shift. Um, another way of looking for planets that's been very successful, especially recently, is called the transit method. And here, you just look for a bright star. It's very hard to see the surface of the star, so you can't directly look for a planet crossing across the surface of the star. But when a planet does that, it blocks out a little bit of the light from the star. And so the light from the star seems to dim temporarily while the planet goes in front of it. So that's called the transit method. You look for missing light. And there are a couple other methods, but the most exciting, I think, recently has been direct imaging. So this is where you actually go out and take a picture of the planet. And the reason why this is difficult, or it used to be difficult, is because, well, it still is difficult, is because it's like if you have a big searchlight pointed right at you, and you're looking for a firefly buzzing around the searchlight, right? It's, it's very difficult to see faint things like planets next to extremely bright things like stars. But it is possible. It's been done here at Berkeley. This is um, an image taken by Paul Callis here at Berkeley with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see the star has been blocked out in the center here. There's a dust ring orbiting around the star, which we already knew about. And you can see a little planet orbiting just inside the dust ring. You may not believe me that it's there, but they actually can tell that it's there, and you can see it moving from year to year. There should be a, a new image on here any time now. Um, so there's one of the first two planetary systems that was discovered around the same time, this system called HRU 799. There was a star surrounded by three planets. Now there are four. How far away? Is, are the planets from the star or the star from Earth? Um, so that's a good question. Uh, this system is what? It's, um, it's a few tens of light years away. Both of these systems are about tens of light years away. So they're very close by. Yeah. It's relatively close by. Um, okay, and here's another one surrounded by a dusty disk with a planet orbiting inside the disk. And I should point out that actually all three of these systems, you can't see it in this picture, but this system also has a big dusty disk around it. All three of these systems, people guessed that there were probably planets because of the presence of these dusty debris disks, like the Zodiac light in their solar system. So now we've actually taken direct images of planets, and we can look for planets that way. Okay, so the next question is what do we see when we look at other solar systems using this method? And probably a lot of you have heard of some of these things before. The first kind of planet that was discovered is called a hot Jupiter. So these are things that are the mass of Jupiter, but they're closer than Mercury to their central stars. So that's very strange, right? Because we said the reason why gas giants are in the outer part of the solar system is because they formed outside this ice line. So how on Earth do you form a Jupiter-sized planet inside the ice line right next to the star? It seems impossible. So, and actually that's the reason why a lot of people didn't believe the discovery of the first planetary system for a long time, because it was so completely unexpected, the type of planet that they found. Um, we've also found super-Earths, which are things that are sort of two to ten times the mass of the Earth. Um, we have nothing like that in our solar system. We basically jump straight in mass from Earth up to the ice giant planets. Um, so in other solar systems, there are kind of intermediate planets, somewhere in between the Earth and Neptune. Also, there are giant planets far from the host star. So this direct image planetary system that I showed you, this was bizarre, because these planets are um, probably several times the mass of Jupiter, and they're out <coughs> beyond Pluto's distance from the star, one to two Pluto distance from their central star. So these are also completely unexpected. We have no idea how you make gas giant planets that far out. OK, so these are strange planets. How did they get there? Well, the massive planets, the Jupiter mass planets that are close to the star and far away from the star, one idea about how they might have gotten there is called migration. So that's the idea that you form a planet in the disk, and while it's forming in the disk, before the disk goes away, it can interact with the disk, and the disk can move it. It can slingshot it in towards the star, or move it out to the outer parts of the planetary system. That's not the only idea, of course, especially for those gas giants far from the star. Somebody um, was mentioning this earlier. You don't have to form these things by the core accretion process. One idea is that especially far from the star, you might be able to just have them collapse by themselves under the influence of gravity, gas and dust at the same time, and that's how you can form, potentially form a planet without a core, is, uh, is by this gravitational instability process. But that doesn't work very close to the star. So we're a little bit confused at this point, but migration is almost certainly the way you get hot Jupiters. It's not clear yet how you get those massive planets far from the star. OK, so let's go back to this question. Is our solar system normal? And I've just told you about these very strange planets, right? But really, so you might think, well, obviously our solar system isn't normal because of all these strange planets that we found around other 
stars. But the, the problem is that even if our solar system is normal, at this point, we wouldn't know. And the reason for that is reflected in this plot. This is the only graph that I'm going to show in this talk. On the x-axis here, we have the distance from the star to the planet. This is the size of Earth's orbit here. This is 10 times smaller than Earth's orbit. And on this axis, we have the mass of the planet. So here's Jupiter's mass, and the Earth's mass would be down here. So you can see we actually do at this point know about a lot of Jupiter mass planets, um, well, at Jupiter distances, which is right about here, Jupiter distances from the central star. So we actually have found Jupiter analogs from that other star. So we think those are probably not too uncommon. What about Earth's? So an Earth would be about this mass and about here on the graph, and there's nothing there. Does that mean that there are no Earths? The answer to that is actually no. Uh, so why does this graph look the way it does? <laughs> so what do you see here? You see a lot of massive planets, right? A lot of things high up on this graph, and you see a lot of things close to the star. And that's because those are the easiest to find. It's easy to find a big massive thing. It's easy to find something that's close to the star, so it tugs on the star more. Uh, so those are the things that are easy to find, or it's more likely to pass in front of the star. The red ones are transiting planets, and the blue ones are radial velocity planets, wobble method planets. Could you send the game the red on what? The red are transiting planets. Those are the ones that pass in front of the star and walk out a little bit of its light. And the blue ones are ones that were found using that wobble method, looking for the wobble in the star that says that there's a planet. Thank you. Yeah. So that's the reason this graph looks the way it does, is because so far we've only found the planets that are easy to find. And um, luckily, we are now uh, carrying out missions that are actually going to answer this question of how normal Earth is. And the big one right now, Kepler, up in space, so we're about to find out how normal our solar system is in a lot of different ways. So Kepler is a space telescope that's up there right now, and it's staring at a patch of sky with a constellation Cygnus. And as it stares at that patch of sky, it's looking for these little dips that tell you about transiting planets. Now Kepler has already found lots of really, really cool planets. It's found ones with the density of styrofoam. It's found the darkest planet known that's like blacker than coal. It's found, just this week, it found the first planet orbiting two stars the first circumbinary planet, just like half moon from Star Wars. Um, so anyway, Kepler, <laughs> Kepler has found all kinds of amazing planets. But its real mission is to look for Earth analogs. So you probably haven't heard them make an announcement yet that they found an Earth analog. But that doesn't mean that they're not out there. That's because Kepler, so Kepler has a three-year mission, and it's been up about two years now. Um, but Kepler, before it reports a planet, it wants to watch the planet go in front of the star three times. So if you were watching our solar system, from a distant star, how often does the Earth pass between you and the Sun? Once a year, right? So that's why it's a three-year mission. They want to wait for those Earth-like planets to pass around three times. So within the next year, we will have an answer to how common Earth-like planets are around other stars. Now I should mention, before, before you guys get me on this, is that Earth-like planet means something about the size of Earth, about the distance of Earth from the star. So Venus would count. And Venus is not a place that you would want to live, right? A surface hot enough to melt lead and it rains sulfuric acid. So a lot of these Earth-like planets will not be habitable planets, but they will be, uh, but some of them might be, right? The Earth would show up in this survey as a planet that's an Earth-sized object at Earth's distance from the star. Yes, some questions? Uh, how far will Kepler be able to detect Earth-sized planets? So this is an interesting thing. Um, Kepler, because it's staring at one patch of sky, it can detect them pretty far out. And that's actually a problem because it's very hard to follow up these planets. So normally what happens is you do a transit search and you find some planets, you find some planet candidates and you confirm them using the Wobble method. That's like the gold standard. You find a transiting planet, you use the Wobble method to make sure it's an Earth mass planet and not something masquerading as an Earth mass planet. So like two stars that are kind of eclipsing but they only block out part, each star only blocks out part of the other star. So it looks like a planet, but it's not actually a planet, it's a binary star. So, Kepler will be able to find a lot of these planet candidates far out, but some of them will not be real planets. When you say far out, do we know in terms of light years? Oh, in terms of light years, um, it's going to be out to hundreds of light years. Yeah. So much farther than current surveys. Yeah. Well, I'm a person who read this story about that too many things, and in a way, it's misleading.
interesting. We, we sort of knew that these kinds of planets have to exist. And it's, it's really exciting that they found it, you know, whether you want to call something a star or a planet. But um, the, the reason why we knew that these planets were going to exist is that we actually do see these disks of gas and dust around binary stars. We see that fairly frequently. So we know that these planet forming regions exist around binary stars. Right here, yeah. that there were two theories about how such systems might exist. One of them is the close-in planets theory, where it's so close to one of the stars, the influence of the other is very important. The other one is the way far out, where mm -hmm. they can basically dig the point now. Yeah, yeah. But this is right in the middle. Of right, it. yeah, that's, that's actually, yeah, that was the thing that was really interesting about this planet. And so you're right, and again, bringing this back to disks, we do see both of those situations. We see two binary stars that are very far apart, and they each have fairly uninterrupted disks, and planets could potentially form in those disks, and we actually, Kepler has found planets like that before. And we see disks around binary stars that are very close together, and they have a big disk around them. And so planets can form around a binary star. But this was the first one that was really orbiting the binary. But it was interesting because it was in this parameter space that we didn't think there could be planets. And maybe it won't stay there for very long as the other were thinking about it. We might have just caught it at the right time before something gets kicked out of the system. OK. Um, so it's an exciting time. We're about to find out how common Earth-like planets are around other stars. And it's really remarkable when you think that 16 years ago, we didn't even know for sure that there were any planets around other stars. And within the next year, we're going to find out how many Earth-like planets there are around other stars. It's really an incredible time to be alive and to be studying these things. Um, there are lots of other missions that are going to be looking for planets, and they cover different parts of the, for the planetary systems. So I showed you that we already know about how many Jupiters there are around other stars. Um, they seem to be fairly common. But what about planets like Uranus and Neptune? And one of the ways that um, people, including me, are hoping to search for Uranus and Neptune analogs in the future is using big radio telescopes like this. Now, Uranus and Neptune analogs are actually very, very difficult to find because they're far away from their star and they're small. But the way you can do it, one way you can do it is by studying the dusty disks, these debris disks, like the zodiacal light in other solar systems. So we think what's going to happen is that if a star has a planet like Uranus or Neptune orbiting it, that planet should interact with the dusty disk, and you should be able to look for these clumps orbiting around the star. These are resonant points. So like Pluto is in resonance with Neptune, we think that the dust will be in resonance with the planet. So this is one way that we hope to fill in the Uranus-Neptune mass analogs around other stars. OK, so just to review, everything in the solar system formed out of a single cloud of gas and dust flattened into a disk. You see it from your own backyard, and the Hubble Space Telescope sees it in the Orion Nebula. Planet properties are determined by where they form in the disk. You get rocky planets, you get gas giant planets, and you get quicker built objects. And we observe a huge variety of planetary system architectures. We don't yet know how normal the solar system is, but we're about to find out, and we're about to find a whole lot of Earth analogs. So the last thing that I wanted to bring up is, great, when do we move? <laughs> right? So we, we are now going to have a sample of Earth-like stars uh, or, or of stars that host Earth-like planets. Uh, this is the closest star to the Earth, Proxima Centauri. Um, how long would it take us to get there, using technology that we currently know about or think we could build? Well, if you use an ion drive, which is a fairly common method of technology, it would take you about 81,000 years. So don't hold your breath. Um, gravitational assist will get you there a little faster, 19,000 years. Um, there's also a method called uh, nuclear pulse drives, which um, we think we actually know how to build. The technology seems to be fairly well developed in theory, but nobody can build them in space because of the nuclear test ban treaty, so they haven't been tested yet. Um, but a nuclear pulse drive could maybe get you there within your lifetime, um, within someone's lifetime. But the point is that it's actually going to be incredibly difficult to leave our planet, to leave our solar system. And so <laughs> this, is, this is a remnant from my days with the National Park Service. So does anyone recognize this planet? Someone say it back there. It's Earth. It's Earth, yes. So this is a very important planet. This image was taken by the Voyager spacecraft. Um, about when it was about the distance of the sun from Pluto, it turned around and it took a picture of the planet Earth. So um, Carl Sagan has made a, a big deal about this image. It's, it's actually a really incredible image because everybody you know, all of human history, took place on this one little dot in space. So you're very, very small and insignificant. And so what Carl Sagan says is that there's no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. It underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the tales of dot, the only home we've ever known. 
So my point is that even though we're in this exciting time in human history, we're finding all kinds of um, different planets around other stars, we're even finding Earth-like planets, it's still important to remember the value of our own planet hanging out here in space. All right, so thank you very much, and I'll take any questions that you have. You 
you actually get a good sense of the planet's distance from the star by watching it transit, how long it takes it to transit, and you have some idea of the size of the star. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, 
thinking about the sun as a star, right? What would the sun look like if you were viewing it from a different system? We almost have too much information about our sun. Uh, we can see a lot of details about how individual patches of the sun move in and out in response to, you know, turbulence on the sun, um, sunspots. We can observe that, but it's actually very hard to observe the whole sun and see what it would look like. Um, so sure, we understand a lot about the gravity of the sun. We can predict it. We can predict how our motion around the sun is affected by tugs from other planets. All of that we can predict, but it's actually really hard to observe on our own sun. 